Good morning, everyone. We will allow another uh, two to three minutes. All right, it's uh, seven or two, and I see we have uh, quite a bit of participants. So we can get started. Good morning once again. I'm going to be your faculty for regulation for the next few weeks. My name is Surinder Kaur, and you can call me Suri. If you can hear me clear and loud, please put your responses in the chat window. You can type a yes or a why. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. So welcome to the first uh, session on regulation. Now, as I mentioned, people who have attended the orientation session, they know what we are going to learn. But just for the benefit of everyone, regulation is divided into two parts. We have the tax part and we have the law part. So in this subject, we have around six chapters. I will be teaching you from chapter one to four. And the law part, which is more theoretical, will be taken by another faculty uh, at Simandar. All right. So the first two chapters that we are going to cover is on individual taxation. Okay. So uh, individual taxation, again, uh, you know, because the curriculum has changed, certain sections of the individual taxations are now part of your tax planning and compliance, which is your discipline subject. So I would say, that the core subject, which is something that is mandatory for everyone to write, uh, the syllabus uh, is, you know, cut down by 20%. So that's a good news. Uh, the complexity of the subject is somewhat reduced, but we still have a lot of concepts that we are going to cover here. Uh, remember that taxation for each jurisdiction is different. So I do not expect anyone to know anything about US taxation. That's how I am going to teach, uh, considering that nobody is aware what is US taxation. All right. So the first two or three classes, uh, we are going to go really slow because we are going to come across a lot of tax terminology. Uh, so I don't want to overwhelm people with a lot of information. Uh, people who have already worked in tax compliance world or into tax consulting, please don't get restless uh, because there are a lot of people in the group who are not aware about US taxation. So we will pick up the speed eventually after the second or the third class. Also, we are going to spend a lot of time on regulation one, uh, because there are a lot of concepts that we would like to decode here, which we are going to build upon in the future chapters, all right? So what you see in individual taxation, there would be some overlap of, of those concepts when we do the corporate taxations. There would be some overlap all, on those concepts when we do the property transaction. All right. So that's the reason we are going to spend a lot of time understanding the first module, the first chapter, which is individual taxation. Now, talking about the individual taxation, um, you know, I'm sharing my screen. Again, put a response in the chat window if you're able to see my screen so that I can walk you through the modules that we would be covering. All right. Thank you so much. Oh, I feel that the people are all awake uh, early morning. So that's a good sign. And thank you so much for putting your responses in the chat window. So what are we going to learn in individual taxation? So individual taxation, again, you know, the complexities of the calculation can go up or down. But the formula to calculate the individual taxation is the same, all right? Uh, compared to 
when you work on an entity taxation. So, you know, you, you may be per performing or preparing a tax return for a partnership. Now, a partnership can operate as a private equity. A partnership can operate as a real estate. A private equity can operate as a hedge fund. A private equity, you know, a partnership can operate as, um, um, I would say, uh, like an insurance company. So the calculation, the taxation, the terminology of preparing an entity may be very different to what you do for an individual taxation. So here, where once you learn how to calculate the taxes of an individual, that does not change. What can change is the complexity. So one individual may have less schedules, the other individual may have more schedules. One individual may have less investments, the other individual may have more investments, all right? So what we are going to do is we are going to learn the entire formula of how to calculate individual taxation. Now, each formula, the you know, the each component of the formula is, uh, that's what we are going to learn. And in each component, we are going to understand what, what all is included, all right? So if you see the module, we will start with the filing requirements and filing status. So in the United States, there are different tax brackets based on the filing status of an individual. All right. So we'll understand as to why there are different filing status. What is the meaning of those filing status? And then we will get into the formula of the calculation. So we will start with the gross receipts. So under gross receipts, the focus area will be not only to include the income, uh, you know, most of the income that, uh, that we earn is subject to taxation. The focus area will be more about the income that is not subject to taxation. The exceptions where the income can either be deferred or the income that can be excluded, all right? Again, two terminologies that I'm using here. Deferred means that you may not recognize the income immediately. There may be another implication at a later date in the future. Excluded means that you have earned the income, the money is with you, but you may not have to pay taxes on it. So please focus on these two sections because if an income is to be excluded or if the income is to be deferred, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, the body that governs the U.S. taxation in the United States, uh, you know, like the taxation in the United States, uh, they will spell out specifically if something is not to be included. Otherwise, consider that everything that you own is income and subject to taxation. So we will learn about gross income. We learn about adjustments. That's again part of your formula. Then uh, we will move forward and learn about itemized deductions and standard deductions. We will learn about the qualified business income deductions. And we will also learn about the tax computations and credits. Now, let me tell you that this is not the entire calculation of the individual taxation. An individual is also subject to alternate minimum tax. That's something that we are not covering in regulation. So let's move on to the formula. This is the most important part. Everyone, I would reiterate that whenever you're doing chapter one, please go back to the formula and be very thorough with the formula. So if you see in this formula, we have, we start with the gross receipts. From the gross receipts, we will minus the adjustments. We also call it the above the line deductions. So after you take your adjustments, you arrive at the adjusted gross income. Now adjusted gross income is a very, very important number. Why do I say that? you will eventually realize when we move forward uh, towards the content that this number is used as a marker by the IRS to see 
if they are going to allow you certain deductions, if they are going to allow you certain credits, if they are going to allow you certain benefits, all those sub benefits are subject to phase out or you will not be allowed certain benefits. All right. After you arrive at your adjusted gross income, you are going to, you know, determine whether you're going to take a standard deduction or you're going to take an itemized deductions. Now, what is standard deductions, itemized deductions? I'll explain you more when we go to that section. After you take those deductions, uh, you will arrive at your taxable income before the qualified business income deduction. Now, qualified business income deduction is a deduction which is given to individuals who have invested in pass-through activities. Now, what is pass-through activities? We will cover a little bit when we are covering the individuals because obviously I want to know what is a pass-through activity. What is the meaning of pass-through activity? So we will understand a little bit about the entity structure in the United States. So any income that you generate from these pass-through entities, that income is subject to qualified business income deduction, which is usually, let's say if you do, if you earn $100, then uh, you get 20% income as excluded uh, from taxes. So that's qualified business income deductions. Uh, again, how to calculate the qualified business income deductions is a little bit complex. So, you know, when, when there are certain concepts which I feel are a little bit complex, I will have more examples on my Word file or, or on my Excel file, or I will share certain notes with you. So then we arrive at the taxable income. After we arrive at the taxable income, now it is important for us to know our filing status because as I mentioned, Depending upon the filing status, we have different tax brackets. So then we are going to calculate our tax liability. And then we will see what kind of credits we are eligible to take. Because tax credits are going to reduce your tax liability dollar to dollar. All right. So once you take the tax credits, uh, you will either have certain payments which are withheld from your paycheck or you made estimated tax payments. And then ultimately you will arrive at your taxes that are due or you may request for a refund if you have paid additional taxes. All right, I'll pause here and I will mention how the class flow is going to be. So, we are all going to be on time by seven. The second important thing is that everyone will be on mute. I have a big panel, so I cannot keep people on unmute and, you know, have them ask their questions because, you know, we'll, we'll waste of time and it is not a very effective way of running a session. Third important thing is that uh, please do not ask your questions in between the session because it's very difficult to teach and then keep looking at the chat window and answering your questions. So we will keep the last 15 to 20 minutes of the session to take any questions that you may have on the content that we would be covering that day, right? So let's say that today, if I'm teaching you about filing status, uh, after I complete explaining the content, we will leave the last 50 to 20 minutes of the session for you to come back and ask me any questions uh, on the content that we are going to cover. All right. And the last but not the least is that whenever I ask a question, please put your uh, responses in the chat window uh, so that I know that you are listening to the session and you're able to understand because we are all in the virtual world now. So my, the only way that I would know uh, whatever I'm teaching, you're able to get it if you put your responses in the chat window when I'm asking a question. All right. Does that make sense? Can we get started? Yes, no, maybe. All right. So I'll not go into the details of the formula right now, but let's understand 
why someone needs to file a tax return. All right? As per IRS, they say that if you are making income which is more than your standard deductions, then you should file your tax return. Now, what is standard deduction? This is something that we saw when we were looking at the formula for individual taxation. Like India, in the United States also, they give you a lump sum deduction. So like if, if you are filing your tax returns in India, we do get a lump sum deduction of $50,000, right? Uh, so there also in the United States, depending upon your filing status, which we are going to cover shortly, you get a lump sum deduction, all right? So if you are earning income, which is more than your standard deductions, you should file a tax return, right? So that's the requirement that they have listed. Also in United States, there are certain benefits that are provided if you attain a age, which I would call as an elderly age, so certain benefits are provided. So someone who is above 65 or someone who is blind, they will get some additional standard deduction. So let's say that for me, if the standard deduction is X, if I'm blind, it will be X plus 10%, okay, or X plus $1,000. So I get more deductions that can help me to reduce my tax liability. That's what the law says. But ideally... What are the few scenarios do you think that even if I do not have taxable income, I should still go ahead and file my tax return? You can put your responses in the chat window. Nobody has to be right or wrong. Every, I mean, we are just learning here. So any responses from the panelists, uh, you know, are welcome. Pass through income, okay. So Puja is saying that if you have invested, uh, you know, in, in passed through entities, then you should file a tax return irrespective whether you have income or not. Or maybe if you have losses. Okay, that's a good response. Anyone else? All right. Uh, thank you so much. If someone needs any tax benefits or rebates, excellent, Lisa, to claim refund. If you have paid more taxes and you do not have any tax liability, then of course you need to file a tax return because you would want your extra money back. To keep a record of the income, okay? Yes, to keep a record of the losses as well, right? Rahul, absolutely correct. If you are self-employed, then the IRS says that if you have income for more than $400, you should be filing a tax return. Anyone else? Okay. For the purpose of lending from financial institutions, um, maybe you're saying that if you have a loan which needs to be reported. All right. So those are great responses. I mean, there could be several reasons uh, why you should file a tax return, uh, you know, Many a times uh, you need to file a tax return because you would, you know, like to get those benefits later in the year. So especially when you have, you know, uh, I would say especially when you have limitation on taking certain deductions. So eventually if when we move forward, you will see that there are limitations on the uh, taxes that you, the tax deductions that you can take. There are limitation on the charitable contribution deduction that you can take. Uh, there are limitation on the passive activity losses that you can take, right? Uh, there are limitation on the credits that you can take. Some credits can be carry forwarded. Some credits uh, cannot be. So those benefits, if you if you want to take those benefits, it is always advisable to file a tax return. Filing, not filing a tax return is not a crime. If your income is not subject to taxation, then you may not file a tax return. It's not a crime. But ideally, if you, you're, if you're someone who's earning more than standard deductions, then you should be filing a tax return. All right. 
Now, when you need to file the tax return for an individual, the due date is April 15. And in the United States, uh, if you file Form 4868, then you can get a six months automatic extension to file the tax return. That means instead of filing a tax return on April 15, you can file it on October 15. Now, remember that the extension is only to file the tax return. The extension is not to pay the taxes after six months. So whatever taxes that is due, you will have to make the payments by April 15. But you do get a six months extension to file the tax return. So you can just file an extension of Form 4868 by April 15 and request an extension from the IRS. And then later, after six months or any time between the six months, you can file your tax returns. All right. Now we come to the most important part. That is the starting portion of the uh, individual taxation. So filing statuses. As I mentioned that the, why do we need to know filing statuses? Because each filing status has a different tax lab. Now in the United States, the individual taxation is a progressive tax taxes. That means as in when your income goes up, your tax rate also goes up. Okay. So we have five filing statuses there. So the first one is single. Single means that you are not married or you are legally separated. Okay. Then we have the joint return, which we also call it married filing jointly. So if you are married as of on the 31st of December of the calendar year, then you are considered married and Husband and wife, instead of they filing two separate returns, two separate 1040, individual will file form 1040. So instead of they filing two 1040s, they can file a one 1040. So that's married filing jointly. Okay. Also, in the year the spouse passes away, that year as well, you can file as married filing jointly. Okay. Again, there are diff different tax brackets for married filing jointly. Now, there's another filing status, which is called married filing separately. So, you're married, but you don't want to file the tax return with your wife or your husband. You want to file it separately. Okay. Now, what are the few reasons why people will still, they're married, but they would still like to file separately? And let me tell you that this is the least lucrative tax lab that is available. So you get a lot of benefits if you are filing married fund jointly, but most of the benefits are not there. And the tax lab is also not very lucrative if you're filing as married filing separately. What are the few reasons why people can file separately illegal income absolutely if someone you know is uh, into drug dealing or someone is doing something that, that that's ethical unethical i wouldn't want to uh, you know file with that person of course someone is in the process of getting separated or someone is getting in the process of getting divorced uh, you can file separately uh, not really. I would say, you know, one of the reasons people file uh, together is because they can get a better tax lab. They can get more benefits. So, uh, you know, getting a better tax uh, benefit for my married filings as separately will not be always the best answer. But there could be many reasons, uh, you know, people would like to file separately. You may be living in different states, but you can still file as married filing to, uh, jointly. Uh, living in different state does not, uh, I would say, stop you from filing jointly. So that's our third filing status. And then we have the fourth status, which is qualifying widower and head of household. Okay. Now these two filing status 
have additional requirements. All right. So you need to pay attention to these two filing status. Now, qualifying widow or widower, again, uh, Sheena, I would request people to please keep a note of your questions. We will take up all the questions once I'm done explaining the session. All right. Thank you so much. So qualifying widow or widower are the people whose spouses passes away. So for them to give certain tax benefit, they can use the same tax lab as married filing jointly, but they will have to for satisfy certain condition. What is, this, uh, what is that condition? That they do not remarry, uh, you know, in the next two years because qualifying widow or widower status is only given two years after the death of the spouse. So let's say that if someone's spouse passes away in the year 2021, 2021, they will file as married filing jointly. 2022, if they do not remarry, they can file as qualifying widow or widower, provided they satisfy the other conditions. And 2023, again, they can file as qualifying widow or widower. Starting from 2024, they may have to file either as single if they are still not married, or they can file as head of household if they satisfy certain requirements. Now, what are the requirements? First requirement we already covered. Of course, you do not remarry. Because after you remarry, then what is your filing status? If you get married again, then what's your filing status? Your filing status is married filing jointly. But remember that you can always file as married filing separately, even if you're married. But you cannot use the status as qualifying widow or widower anymore. The second most important requirement is that you are supporting a dependent child. So that means you are taking care of more than half of his cost of maintaining a household. And the child is staying with you for the whole taxable year. Okay. Also, what's very important here is that the definition of the dependent child is going to change based on the concepts that we are going to cover, okay? For, so for a qualifying widow or a widower, the dependent child can be an adopted child, can be a stepchild of the surviving spouse, or it can be your own child, but it cannot be a foster child. Now, foster child, uh, you know, concept is uh, quite famous in the United States. So, let's say, for example, uh, you know, there there is war that is going in Syria, right? Or there are war zones that, that are there all across the world. If a certain government agency put these children that they rescue from the war zone at your place to support them, uh, because, you know, you want to support them, you want to take care of their education. These are called foster child. So they like, you know, they they are not your legal, you're not there, you've not legally adopted them, but you are supporting them to help them have a better life. So those children which are uh, legally placed into your house so that you can support them, they do not qualify as, a, you know, as a status for you to get a filing status as a qualifying widow or a widow, all right? But when we do the head of household, you will see that the dependent child definition will differ a little bit. So what are the two conditions that we need to satisfy? That we do not remarry for the next two years and we are supporting a child for whom we are taking care of more than half of the expenses and that child is staying with us for the entire taxable year. Now, there is a possibility that due to, uh, you know, some schooling requirement or some other requirement, the child may have to stay in a different place. Uh, now, we are talking about the exceptions. So, remember, whenever there is a law, there is an exception to the law. 
So the general rule is that the child should be staying with you for the entire taxable year. But there could be exceptions where, you know, the child may not stay with you for the entire year, but you still may you know, qualify for a qualifying widower or widower. So the two years after the death of the spouse, you can file for this status if you satisfy both the requirements and you get to use the same tax slab as married filing jointly. And the last filing status that we have is the head of household. Now, the way the United States have designed the tax structure is uh, very interesting because they try to give benefit to the people if they are taking care of the other people. All right. So what is head of household? Head of household means that if someone does not fall under any of the category that we have covered just now, so they are not married or they are not a widow or a widower, but they are taking care of the other family members, then the IRS wants to give certain benefits to them because, you know, they, they are helping to, or, or I would say they're helping to take care of the other people that are, that's there in their family. So then you can file as head of household, wherein you get better tax slabs than what you will get as married, uh, I than what you will get as um single filing single so in order to be qualifying as a head of household you should not be married and uh you know you you do, do not fall under the category of a qualifying widow or a widower and you are not a non-resident alien what do you what do we mean by non-resident alien that means that you are someone who is either a resident or a citizen of United States. Okay. Alien here does not mean uh, the alien that comes from another planet. That means that you are not someone who is a resident or a citizen of the United States. So if you are not falling, off, falling under any of the category that are listed that we have covered just now. And you provide for the expenses of the household for more than 50% of the person and the person is residing at your place. Uh, you know, your place is the principal resident for the person whom you are maintaining more than 50% of the cost. Then you can qualify for head of household. Now, this person who's staying with you can be your parents that means can be your relatives can be your children's okay and uh, so they can be your relatives you they can be your parents and they can be your children's okay now here the definition of a qualifying child is a little bit different to the definition that we have covered under the qualifying widow or a widow so under the head of household Foster child is also considered as a qualifying child. So when we did the qualifying widow or widower definition, the qualifying child, foster child did not fall under that category. But here foster child is also considered as your qualifying child. Your brother and sisters, if they are, you know, below a certain age, they can also qualify as your qualifying child, okay? So here the definition is broader. So that means they are trying to help you to get this filing status, even if you are helping your siblings who are below a certain age, the foster children, and get a better tax lab so that you do not have to pay the same tax liability as someone who is an individual, right? So as I mentioned, that the first criteria is that you do not fall under any of the filing statuses that we have covered. And the second most important is that you are maintaining the household for either your parent, your children, or your relative. Now for parents, there's an, you know, there's an exception again. Like parents need not necessarily 
stay with the tax bill. Okay. So let's say that I'm a working professional and my mom needs a, you know, a, a nurse or a care 24 into 7. Now I cannot do it all by myself because I'm a working professional. So I may put her in a, a hospital or I may put her in a nursing home for, for her to be taken care of. As long as I provide for more than half of the cost of, you know, for her upkeeping, like I provide for the utilities, I provide for the food, I provide for the mortgage interest, I provide for the property taxes, I provide for the insurance. If I'm maintaining more than 50% of the cost for my parents, irrespective whether they are staying with me or whether they're not staying with me, I can still go ahead and qualify for a head of household. Also, as I said that, you can also benefit if you're taking care of your relative. So who all fall under the definition of a relative? Your grandparents, your brother, sister, aunts, uncle, nephew, niece, and, you know, uh, the other people. Who does not fall under the dependent relative is your cousins, your foster children, foster parents, and your unrelated dependent who do not qualify. So let's say that, uh, you know, I have a boyfriend who does not do anything and I take care of all his expenses and he's staying with me throughout the year. Will he help me to qualify as a head of household? Why no? No is the correct answer. Absolutely. Someone is saying yes. Yes, they ideally should be staying in the United States. No blood relationships. Absolutely. See, my boyfriend or my girlfriend is not related to me, right? So even if I am supporting 100% of the cost and that person is staying with me, uh, you know, throughout the year, that may not help me to get the status of head of household. But we are going to do the definition of a dependent relative and we are going to do a definition of a dependent child after we cover this. So you will see that under that definition, if someone is staying with you throughout the, throughout the taxable year, they can qualify as a dependent relative. So that's when we are doing the definition of a dependent. But when it comes to head of household, the person who's not related to you will not help you to get the filing status of head of household. Now, this is a summary of the qualifying dependent. If you are filing for you know, a head of household. So dependent or child can be a qualifying dependent. The answer to that is yes. Has to live with the taxpayer. The answer to that is yes. Parent can be a qualifying dependent. Do they have to live with the taxpayer? The answer to that is no. Other relatives can be qualifying dependent and they have to live with the taxpayer. So for a child, for a person to qualify as a head of household, the child has to stay with the taxpayer for the entire tax year or more than half of the year. All right. I see only Amar answering. More than half of the year. Yes. So now a dependent child, let's say my own child, if I'm supporting if I have to qualify for a head of household, that, that child should be staying with me for more than half of the year. But if I'm filing for a qualifying widow or a widower status, then the child has to stay with me for the entire taxable year. All right. So these are some nitty gritties of the concepts which you will be hands on. If you go back and read the content that we have covered, all right? 
So now what we are going to do is we are going to move on to the definition of a dependent de definition, which can be a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. Now you may ask me that why are we learning these definitions? So let me give you a little bit of background. Before 2018, that is before the tax reform. So there was a major tax reform in the United States. And a lot of things changed after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came into picture. So before 2018, that is, you know, when I wrote my examination in 2012, 2013, that time, if you had a dependent, you would get additional deduction. So let's say that I have a dependent mother, I have a dependent father, I have a dependent child. So I have three people who are dependent on me. So for each dependent person, I used to get a certain deduction. So let's say for one dependent, it's 4,000. So if I have three, it'll be four into three, $12,000 of deduction. But after the Tax Cut and Jobs Act came into picture, they took out the benefit of this deduction which was given based on how many dependents you have. But why are we still going ahead and learning the definition? Because you will see that there are a lot of credits, there are a lot of deductions which are available if you have a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. Okay, so let's say for example if I am incurring medical expenses for my mother. If she satisfies the requirement of a qualifying relative, then I will be able to take those medical expenses on behalf of my mother. Though I'm filing my tax return, but since my mother is a dependent and she satisfies all the requirement of a qualifying relative, I will be allowed to take, to take the medical expenses which I have incurred for my mother. Likewise, uh, if you would have seen, we spoke about the credits which reduce your tax liability dollar to dollar. So if, let's say, I there are some elderly credits that are available, right? Or there are some dependent credits that are available. So if I satisfy the you know, definition of a qualifying child or a qualifying relative, I may be eligible to take those credits. So though after the tax reform, I do not get those dependency deductions, but I still need to know the definition because there are other benefits that I can get if I know if I have a qualifying child or a qualifying relative. Now be mindful that with every concept that we would be covering, there may be some tweak to the definition. We've already seen that tweak when it came to a qualifying child for a widow or a widower or for a qualifying child for a head of household. So foster child is not something that will help you to qualify as a qualifying widow or a widower, but a foster child can help you to get a head of household status. Likewise, when we move into the other concepts, you will see that the major portion of the definition is not going to change, but there may be certain other tweaks to the definition where the age requirement may be different or there could be, you know, other requirements, additional requirements that may come into picture, all right? So what should help me to have a qualifying child? Like who can be considered as a qualifying child? So they have to satisfy these five requirements. Close relative, age test, residency and filing requirement, elimination of gross income test and the support test. Okay, close relative is pretty easy that they can be your child, they can be your step uh, child, they can be your brother, sister, step brother, step sister if they are falling under the age of 19 or if they are 24 if they are full-time student. A foster child who is placed in the taxpayer by an authorized placement agency also is considered as a qualifying child. 
Now, what's an age limit? Of course, we are speaking about children. So, you know, they have to have an age limit. So they should be under 19. And if they are full-time student, then they have to be at the age of 24. Now, who are considered full-time student? So we need to know the definition of a full-time student as well. A full-time student is someone who is attending an educational institute at least five months during the taxable year. And an educational institute is someone who's maintaining a full-time faculty. So let's say if Simander is all only maintaining uh, visiting faculties like me, because I have a full-time job, I'm just teaching here on, on weekends. So if Simander has only part-time fa faculties like me, will it satisfy the, you know, the definition of a educational institute? All right. So the answer to that is no. So small, small things which we need to pay attention. So someone who is considered a full-time student is attending an educational institution for more than five years. And here the age is more, right? So that's why we are getting into the nitty gritties of understanding who is considered a full-time student. Again, any question, please keep it for the last 15 to 20 minutes of the session. I'll be more than happy to take it. I always take questions in my sessions. I never skip that. All right. The third requirement is that filing residency and filing requirement. So that means this person has to be either a citizen or a resident of United States, Canada or Mexico. Unfortunately, India is not there. But Canada and Mexico is there. All right. Also, the child cannot file a joint tax return unless it is filed only for claiming a refund. So see the definition of a child here is 24 years. If it's a full-time student, that means there's a possibility that the guy is or the girl is married and they want to file a joint return with the spouse so that they can get a better tax, ben tax benefit. So the government obviously do not want to pass on a lot of benefits or they do not want to double dip the benefits. So here they are saying that the child should not be filing a joint tax return unless the return is only filed to claim a refund. Okay, that means there was no tax liability uh, as such on the tax return. There is no gross test uh, application. That means uh, gross test will come into picture when we are looking at the qualifying relative. So let's say that the, the person who is a full-time student, he is making quite a bit of money through a part-time job or anything else. So whatever the child is making, the income or, or the child can be a child artist, you know, is working in movies, making a lot of income. Uh, nowadays, a lot of uh, students, they start, uh, you know, coding and all, and they make their apps and all at the age of 12, 13, and they're already billionaires or millionaires. So what Iris is trying to say is that if your child is generating income, it does not eliminate him or her to be your qualifying child as long as you are contributing or providing more than 50% of the support. So let's say the cost of raising that child is $10,000 per year. As long as you're providing more than 50% of the cost, that child can still be claimed as a dependent child. His income or her income does not, uh, you know, I would say, restrict you from claiming the child as a dependent. So support test is that is the same thing that I mentioned, that you are actually taking care of more than 50% of their expenses. Okay. So, Sometimes in some of the states, you know, they may get give state benefits to the children or the children may uh, get scholarships. As long as uh, that money is spent on them, it does not uh, con is consider who's logging in. 
Sorry about that. So again, you know, if there are scholarships that are received by the child uh, and there are other benefits, state benefits that are given to the child, as long as you are providing more than 50% of the support, you're good to go. You can consider that, you know, child as a qualifying child and get certain benefits. Next, we move on to the definition of a qualifying relative. So in order to be a qualifying relative, what all conditions that you need to satisfy. So the first is the support test. That means you provide more than 50% of the support. All right. Uh, here, the gross income limitation comes into picture. So the child is someone who is considered below 90. Oh my God. Just give me a second, people. I'll just put a message in the chat window for people not to log in. No. Okay, let me try this one more time. This is what happens when you have one login for multiple people. All right, so if this doesn't work, then I'll open the PDF copy. Uh, so let's let's do this once again. So we spoke about the support test. Now here, if you are not a qualifying child, but you fall under a qualifying relative definition, then in this case, uh, you will have to set you know, you, you will have to satisfy the gross income test as well. That means that you should not have a taxable income of more than $4,700, okay? So, which means that uh, uh, you should not be, uh, you know, claiming, a, you cannot claim a person as your relative if the relative is earning more than $4,700 of taxable income. Now this number, this number is adjusted for inflation every year. So for the taxable year 2023, the number may be different. For the taxable year 2024, the number may go up by $50 or $100. So you really do not have to focus so much on the numbers, but it is more important that you focus on the concept. Okay. So, uh, you know, you if someone is earning more than $4,700, then you cannot claim that person as a qualifying relative. Why do you think we have this requirement into place? Why do you think the IRS has put this requirement into place? For a child, it's not there. But for a relative, it's there. What could be the convention behind putting this limitation? No one wants to try. Absolutely. Right. So those are great responses. So if someone is capable of making money, why would you want that person to be your qualifying relative or qualifying dependent? Okay. Child, I can understand the child, you know, may not be able to support himself or even if the child is making money, we still give that benefit of doubt. But for a relative, if they are making, uh, you know, enough money uh, and they have more taxable income, more than the threshold that is given here, you cannot claim that person as a qualifying relative. Okay. Now here, remember that this is taxable income. If someone is having non-taxable income in the form of social security or tax exempt interest income or tax exempt scholarships, then that does not uh, exclude them to be considered as qualified relatives. So let's say my mom is making $10,000 of tax-exempt interest income. Tax-exempt means that that income is not subject to tax issues. So as long as my mom is not making taxable income of more than $4,700, I can still go ahead and claim her as a dependent on my tax return, okay? Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, that if you are 
getting claimed as a dependence on someone's tax return, you should not be filing a joint return. And the person has to be a resident or a citizen of United States, Mexico, or Canada. Unfortunately, India is again not listed here. Okay. Relatives, who can be your relatives? Uh, brother, sister, children, if they are above 19, your, uh, you know, uh, foster parents and cousins are not considered relatives. Foster parents and cousins are not considered relatives, but if they stay with you for the entire year, they can be you know, considered as your qualifying relative. So either they are related to you in some way or the other, or they stay with you for the entire taxable year. Okay, so foster children and cousins, if they stay with the taxpayer for the entire year, then they can still qualify as a qualifying relative. Now, that's the definition of a qualifying relative. But will they help you to get the status of a head of household if they are not related to you? But they are staying with you for the entire taxable year? The answer to that is no. Okay, they cannot help you to get the status of a head of household because the requirement of the head of household is separate. All right. The next thing that we are going to do is the multiple support agreement. Now, before I move on to the multiple support agreement, just to do a recap of to what we have done so far, we learned who needs to file a tax return. We understood the overview of how the individual taxes are uh, calculated looking at the formula and we will be going back to the formula every time we covered a component of the formula. Then we learned about why someone needs to file a tax return, by when someone needs to file a tax return, what is the form that you need to file a tax return. So 1040 uh, in the United States the way they spell out the form is a bit different so we don't say 1040 but we say 1040. So you need to file a 1040. The filing deadline is April 15. You may get an extension by filing form 4868 and file by October 15. But you still have to make sure that you pay your taxes by April 15. Then we covered the different filing statuses that are there. So we have single, we have joint filing, married filing jointly, married filing separately, qualifying widower or widower, 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 and the head of household. Now we uh, did put a lot of stress to understand who is considered or how can you get the filing status of a qualifying widower, widower, what are the additional requirements you have to satisfy, and same for the head of household. We also understood the definition of who can be a qualifying child or who can be a qualifying relative. And remember, we also spoke that the definition for each concept may be tweaked, may get tweaked, tweaked a little bit uh, based on what you are covering. So let's say for head of household, it has to be a relative. Right. Even if the person is not staying, if the person is staying with you for the entire year, it's still not qualify you for the status of head of household. A foster child can be a qualifying child for a head of household, but a foster child cannot be a qualifying child for you to get a qualifying widow or a widower status. So small, small things that you may have to pay attention. That's why there's nothing that you should skip anything when you are doing regulation because there is no pick and choose in this subject. 75 is the passing score and you need to know everything before you go ahead and write the examination. All right. So the next thing that I'm going to move on is the multiple support agreement. Now, what is multiple support agreement? By the name itself, that there are multiple people who are supporting this privileged person. So let's say that my parents have five kids, all right? And all the five kids are sending money to them to support them. And now all the five kids wants to claim them as a dependent, right? So 
in that case, there are certain procedures that are put in place as to who can claim that person as a dependent on the tax return. So the first requirement is that the person who's contributing more than 10% of the support can only be someone who can claim them as a dependent. So the first requirement is that your support should more be more than 10% of their total support. And if the, you know, if you are claiming them as a dependent, you need to, uh, you know, multiple support, you have to, uh, if you're claiming them as a dependent, the joint contributors are required to file a multiple support declaration, which is form 2120. Okay, so let's say today, uh, you, I may mutually agree my, for my brother to claim my parents as a dependent in the year 2023, and then I may claim them as a dependent in the year 2024. And, you know, maybe my other brother is claiming them as a dependent in the year 2025. So first is that we all together should, in order to, to be considered whether we can claim them as a dependent or not, we should at least support 10% of the total cost of their living. And again, there has to also be a declaration that you need to sign. So this is a great example. And we will also cover some of the concepts that we have just recently learned. So let's look at this example here. Peter, who is single and lives alone in Idaho, has no income of his own and is supported fully by the following people. Tim, an unrelated friend. Angie, who is Peter's sister. And Mike, who is Peter's son. So Tim is providing 2,400, which is 48% of the support. Angie is providing 2,150, which is 43% of the support. And Mike is providing $450, which is 9% of the support. Okay. Now, first thing that we have to see is the facts that they have listed. So they are saying that Peter is single. Why the filing status is important for us? Why the filing status of the dependent is important to us? Deductions and tax labs. Absolutely. Thank you so much. For the people, uh, for your chat, you know, for your responses in the chat window, what did we learn about the qualifying relative that precludes dependent filing a joint return? Okay, so that means that if I want to, you know, take someone as a dependent on my tax return, that person whom I'm claiming as a dependent should not be filing a joint tax return. So, if Peter is single, do you think he can file a joint tax return? No, right? So, that means one criteria is satisfied. He lives in Idaho. Idaho is a place in United States. Now, why this information is important? Okay, that's again a great response. What did we learn about the requirements of a dependent? That they can only be citizens of United States, Mexico and Canada. So here, by the facts, we know that this person is a citizen of United States. Has no income of its own. Now, why this information is important to us? Again, if we go back to the requirements that they should not have any taxable income which is more than four thousand seven hundred dollars okay so now this information says that peter is not making any money and now they have given us the people who are supporting peter tim who is a unrelated friend angie who is peter's sister and mike who is peter's son now, out of all the three, who's, who is providing more than 10%? Angie and Tim. So that means I can exclude Mike because he's not satisfied 
the 10% criteria. He is not providing more than 10%. Now, between Angie and Tim, I will have to see who can claim this person as a dependent. Can Tim claim Peter as a dependent? Reason is that Tim is not related to Peter. So who's left? Who meets the dependency requirements here? Angie is the one who's meeting. So support test is met by Tim and Angie. Gross income and filing status is met. US citizen is met. Related to Tim, the answer to, to that is no, but he's related to An Angie and he's not living with any of the other person. So, you know, this option is grayed out. So that's how you determine who can claim them as a dependent when it is a multiple support agreement. Now, what happens to the people who are staying, who children of the divorced parents? A very sad fact, but uh, here, if someone has children and they get divorced, the time test is more important than who has the divorce degree or who has the legal rights to you know, to claim the child as a dependent. So let's say that my husband is very, my ex-husband is very influential, okay? And I have a child and he is able to take the custody of the child. But obviously the child is not liking the father and the child is staying with me for 90% of the taxable year. Then who can claim the child as a dependent on the tax return? The mother. That is me, I'll be able to claim the child as a dependence on the tax return because here it is determined by the time test and not by the divorce decree. Let's say if both the parents have equal custody, right? Then the parents who have higher adjusted gross income can will claim the child as a dependent. So again, I did mention that adjusted gross income is a very important number because it is going to help you determine whether you can claim certain benefits or not. All right. Now, the second module that uh, we are going to move on is the gross income module. But because this is our first class um, and I mentioned that I'm going to go really slow. So I will pause here and I will now open the forum for any questions that you may have on the content that I have covered so far. Come on, people, this is your time to ask me any question that I missed on the chat window. Uh, okay, Sheena had a question. Can we change our filing status each year? Sheena, the answer to that is yes, why not? One year you can file as married filing jointly. The other year, if you're not liking your husband, you can file as married filing separately. Nobody is stopping you to do that. Uh, how do we pay taxes first and file later? Can you explain in Indian context? Well, I can't explain you in Indian context, but what I can explain you is that uh, let's say if you are doing businesses in the United States, and this is something that we will cover at a later part, you are supposed to estimate as to how much income you are going to make in a particular year. And each quarter you make certain payments. So let's say that you are estimating that you are going to have an income of $100,000. And you are in a tax bracket of 10%. So that is $10,000. So you should ideally be paying $2,500 every quarter. And then when you're filing the tax return, if there is anything that is due or still left to be paid, that you should be filing with your tax return, which is on the uh, March, sorry, April 15th. Uh, can you please, again, Cheyenne has a question. Please explain qualifying widower ones. 
Oh, Shannon, I spent so much of time explaining it, but for you, I'll do it again. So in order to be a qualifying widow or a widower, you will have to satisfy two requirements. First is that after the death of the spouse, you do not remarry for the next two years because this filing status is only available for the next two years. Okay. So you do not remarry in the next two years and you are supporting a child. Now it can be your own child. It can be your stepchild. So supporting means that you're providing more than 50% of the cost of the household and the child is staying with you for the entire taxable year. So if you satisfy these two requirements, then you can have a filing status of a qualifying widow or a widower. That means you can use the same tax brackets that a married filing jointly will be using. So these are like the most lucrative tax brackets, which will help you to reduce your tax liability. So it's in a way IRS is trying to help you when you are already in grief, when you're already having a loss in your life. Okay. Uh, Full-time education covered courses, can courses like CPA be considered? Now, uh, Debushri, if courses like CPA needs to be considered, uh, then the answer to that is, are you going to an educational institute uh, which has having full-time faculties? And second, are you going for these courses for more than five months in the entire taxable year, right? I do not think that the CPA courses will satisfy that requirement. So someone who's doing a degree or someone who's doing, you know, courses like a master or something, those courses will qualify for a full-time, you know, the definition of a full-time course. Filing status married but living apart for more than six months in the taxable year. Yes, what is... That means that they are married, but they are living separately for more than six months in the taxable year. They can still choose to file as married filing jointly. Nobody is stopping them to do that as long as they are not legally separated. If the extension form, Lisa has a question, is the extension form required to be filed even if we do not owe any taxes? Lisa, if you are not filing your tax return by April 15, uh, you will have to file an extension, uh, you know, if you want to file the tax return after April 15. So irrespective whether you have a payment due or not, if you are not filing your tax return by April 15, you should file an extension so that you can file the tax return at a later date because there is also a penalty that is associated with not filing the tax return on time. So whether you have taxes or whether you don't have taxes, that has nothing to do with your, uh, you know, requesting for an extension. So as long as you're not able to file it by April 15, you should request for an extension. In the cases taxes are auto-debited from pay like TDS in India, how will they uh, the employer decide my filing status? Well, that's a great question, Ankit. Uh, so usually, uh, like in India, you have a portal where you go ahead and claim all your uh, investments, right? So you have a portal where you will show whether you've done an investments, whether you have a property, and you will fill out all the details. Likewise, in United States also, they give that facility to the employee where the employee can go ahead and make the updates to whatever filing status that they're doing, the other deductions that they have so that the employer can calculate the taxes on their behalf and withhold the taxes. In United States, we don't call it TDS. We call it withholding of taxes from your paycheck that is usually in the form of W-2. Okay, 
Mm. Now I see people are getting innovative with their question. In case of child maintenance paid by father and the child lives with mother and grandparents where grandparents also pay for child requirement who can claim the tax deduction. Um, that's a good, great question. Again, it drills down to who is, you know, giving uh, more than 50% of the support. So here, if I'm assuming that the parents are not divorced, uh, and if they are filing a joint tax return, then it doesn't matter. But if let's say the grandparents are, uh, you know, claiming, paying more than 50% of the deduction and the other definitions are met, then the grandparents can claim the child as a dependent. It is not just the cost of the maintenance, but you also have to see the other aspects of the debt definition. Is it mandatory to pay estimated taxes? Again, a great question. That is something that we will cover later in the syllabus. Uh, there are uh, penalties associated if you do not make estimated taxes. Usually, if the tax component is less than $1,000 or you have paid 90 or 100% of your current year taxes or the prior year taxes, then you do not get penalized for not making estimated taxes. But to answer your question, it is mandatory, I would say to, I wouldn't say mandatory, but it, there are repercussions if you do not pay your estimated taxes. That means you may be uh, assessed with a estimated tax payment penalty if you do not estimate your tax and make them make the taxes on a quarterly basis. Reg 1.5.2 qualifying relative point three. Okay, so this I've already explained, but I don't mind explaining it once again. So remember that of the different filing statuses that we have. Married filing jointly is the most lucrative slab, okay? That means they get a higher tax slab. They get a lot of other benefits. So if you are claiming someone as a dependent on your tax return, they should not be filing a joint return to claim the other benefits which comes with filing a joint tax return. Unless they are doing it just for the sake of getting a refund or there were no tax liability if they would have filed separately. So let's say that me and my husband, we are married and I am being taken care of by my mother. So we know that if we file as married filing jointly, we are going to get a refund from the IRS for $1,000, okay? Because there are certain credits that we can claim. So what IRS is saying that if you are married and if you're filing a joint return, if the tax liability component does not change, if you were filing as if you were filing as a single or separately, then you can go ahead and file as, you know, a joint return. But usually you should not be filing a joint return to take benefits there and then getting claimed as a dependent on somewhere someone's else return and also giving them a benefit of maybe claiming them as a status of a head of household or other benefits, other credits that comes into picture. So basically, the IRS is trying to protect their interest. Okay, I have given you certain benefits. Please don't misuse it by doing certain things which may benefit you like to you do a double dipping of of the benefits how do you identify measure that the qualifying widower has paid more than 50 percent cost in real time uh well if you get audited obviously you will iris will make sure that you have to give them all the information but uh you know, if you read the publication, uh, you will see that 
the cost usually if someone is staying at your place the food that you provide uh, the utilities the insurance the medic you know all that you pay that is considered as the you know the cost to bring up a person so as long as you are paying more than 50 percent of the cost you obviously don't have to submit bills and all they don't get get into all that integrities but yes, tomorrow if your return gets audited or if they come and ask you if you really supported your child, then you should be able to satisfy that requirement. But the IRS is not going to come and ask you, please submit all the bills that you've, uh, you've all the food that you've spent, uh, food bills that you've spent on your child to raise the child. Nobody's going to come and ask you. It's something that is ethical and they have laid down the rules and that's what they want you to Look at the rules, apply those rules and pay your taxes because you pay your taxes voluntarily. The rules are there. It's for you to understand the rules, determine your taxes and pay the taxes. If the parents are divorced and sharing equal custody of the child, can they swap the dependent child on the tax return each year? Well, the requirement is that whoever has a higher adjusted gross income, again, the law has spelled out the requirement so whoever has more income, that person can claim the child as a dependent on the tax return. And of course, uh, you know, if they mutually agree among each other, they can. Widow status is available only for two years, even if the widow does not get remarried. Again, a good question, Sheena. The answer to that is yes. So they give you only two years. Uh, to make sure that you know uh, they are they are there for you uh, when you are having a loss in your life so from the third year they would again like to get more taxes from you so even if you are not remarried after two years what you can do is if you still uh, you're supporting a child you can now change your filing status to head of household so it is still a better filing status than single because you get a better tax plan. Tax credit is just like TDS in India? No, absolutely not. Tax credit is it's basically a benefit which helps you to reduce your tax liability. TDS is the taxes that you pay. You're estimating your taxes and you're making the tax payments. But tax credits is altogether a different concept. We will do that when we get there. Uh, absolutely, uh, Devashri, if someone has no income, you can still go ahead and file a joint return. So that is the reason married filing joint, joint uh, jointly is a very lucrative tax lab. There is, uh, you know, even if someone is a homemaker, they can still go ahead and file a joint tax return. The income of one spouse or the other spouse has no impact on what filing status they choose. Okay, yes, Rahul, that's correct. Uh, for the spouse who has not lived with the taxpayer for the, you know, at six months at the close of the taxable year, obviously there, there is more to it. So as long as you're not legally separated, you can still go ahead and file for a marriage filing jointly. Uh, multiple support agreement just is that sometimes when multiple people support the same person, uh, you need to determine who can claim that person on the tax return. So... Anyone who makes who's supporting more than 10% do qualify under that criteria. And then you will have to sign the form 2120 as to see who can claim that person as a dependent on the child, child tax return. Can I file married filing jointly if I'm working in USA, my, but my wife stays in India? Uh, well, again, it would depend if both of you are U.S. citizens or U.S. resident uh, because, you know, there is the bona fide residence rule and then there is a physical presence test rules. So it gets a little bit complicated. I, I cannot have a definite yes or a no here. 
depending upon the facts, if your wife is a U.S. resident and is just staying in India for two, three months, that means uh, she would not satisfy the other requirements. She would not trigger a filing requirement in India. Then you can still go ahead and file for a married filing jointly. But if she is there in India for a longer period or she is not a U.S. citizen or a resident, then the answer to that is no. Is individual taxation tested heavily in the CPA examination? Well, everything that is listed in the syllabus can be tested in the examination. So there is no pick and choose that is happening, my friend. We will have to be very thorough with all the content that is there in order to pass our CPA examination. If someone is getting married on the last date, that is 31st December, then what will be the filing status? The filing status for that will be married filing joint. Uh, there is no standard annual maintenance that is defined. They have just said that more than 50% of the support. Do you need to submit proof of marriage to the IRS if filing jointly? The answer to that is no. So remember these, these taxes you pay voluntarily. Okay. What is our role is to understand the law and then imply the law and then make your tax payments. So nobody is asking you for any proof unless it is absolutely spelled out by the Internal Revenue Service. Which is more beneficial, married filing jointly or head of household if only one person is earning and parents are dependent? I would say that married filing jointly is hands-on more beneficial and you can claim your parent as a dependent if, even if you are married filing jointly uh, because as I mentioned that dependent can give you a status of a head of household but married filing jointly has a better tax slab and you know you can get other benefits uh, like you, you, you can claim your parents' medical expenses and get other credits if you are supporting your parents. So any day married filing jointly is uh, the most lucrative slabs that all the slabs that we have. You should consider uh, Rahul uh, someone who is legally separated then as uh, for the head of household status. Uh, can someone with a single status file a nil return just to get financial gov benefits of government or banks? Uh, there is no financial benefits that is coming from the bank, Ankit. Uh, you may still go ahead and file a tax return if you think that you can benefit by getting certain kinds of credits from the government. But there is nothing that the bank is going to benefit you. Just give me a moment. I just need to open the door. Someone is at the door. All right. I'm back. Uh, Ma'am, can you please explain about the due date and extension of filing? Sure. Um, uh, Mohammed. So there is a filing of the return and uh, due date is that means it's a statutory date which the government has decided for you to file the tax return, right? So let's say for a partnership in the United States, the due date is March 15. Likewise, for individuals, the due date is April 15. So that doesn't change year after year. Uh, so a, by April 15 is when you should be filing your tax return. But let's say that you have not received all the information that is needed for you to file the tax return. Let's say you let's say that you have uh, uh, you know uh, invested in partnerships. The partnership is supposed to give you a K one. They have not given you a K one, right? So you don't have all the information for you to file your tax return. In that case, what you can do is you can estimate whatever payments that you may have for the year and make the payments by April 15, but you can file an extension. That means you can buy some time from the government 
and file your tax return after six months. So the extended due date to file the tax return is October 50. So let's say that I can, I can file an extension. And then if by 30th of April, I have all the information, I can prepare my tax return and file my tax return by April 30th. So I'm just filing the return after 15 days of the due date. So that is what is called the extension of filing. So you get more time to file the tax return, but you do not get more time to pay your taxes. Uh, Karan, please order a new book. Okay. Because there, there are changes to the syllabus. Uh, the syllabus is now comparatively lesser than what we had earlier. So please do not spend time. Uh, I mean, it's always good to have no more. It's always good to have more knowledge. But for the examination purposes, uh, the syllabus, there's quite a bit cut down on the syllabus. So please refer the new book. Uh, Amitabh, it has to be 10% of the total cost. So if the cost is $1,000 for a person, then 10% of that. Uh, you will, these sessions will be recorded, but I don't know if the recording will be submitted today itself. Uh, but yes, they will be recorded and uploaded to the portal. If you are not legally separated and you are staying away from your spouse for more than six months, you can still go ahead and file for married filing jointly. Looks like you are stuck in that question. All right. Uh, uh, Dushant, I'm not sure about the research simulation. Um, I, I have to go back and check with uh, the, you know, with the institute, whether if the research simulation is still part of your examination. And if it is still part of the examination, then uh, we will have a special session on how to do research. Uh, so every time I finish uh, the syllabus, we will do a special class on how to do the research on the authoritative literature because that's a sure shot question that you will see on your examination. And I would like you to equip yourself as to how to do a effective research so that we all can score at least on the sure shot question that we will be getting. But I am not sure if it is still something that's going to come in the examination. So I can come back to you on that next week. Next week or not tomorrow. Don't ask me the same question because I just need some time to go back and check as well. All right. Those were some great questions. Any other question? I mean, we have covered very little today and uh, I'm very happy to see the people how they're asking questions and the way they are taking interest. Uh, so we will cover a uh, gross income section tomorrow. Uh, we will have a little bit of faster pace than what we had today, but a lot of interesting topics to come. Uh, so uh, we can wrap up today a little bit early. I can give you the rest of the day for yourself to study. And then let's meet again tomorrow at seven to cover the gross income section. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. And have a nice day ahead. I'll speak to you again tomorrow. Bye, everyone.